Good Tuesday morning from Hong Kong. It's 9 a.m. here in the city, in Beijing, and in Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets China Open. I'm David Inglis with Yvonne Matt. Our top stories this morning. Treasury is steady in Asia after a rebound following a surprise cut in this quarter's U.S. borrowing levels. Stocks gaining as investors await the Fed decision and big tech earnings. Oil markets in focus as the U.S. seeks a response to the attack on its forces in Jordan that won't trigger a regional escalation. Also ahead, Evergrande's liquidation order poses a big test for global creditors while Beijing pressures cities to help ease the property downturn. And BYD's earnings soar on record sales but fall short of expectations as a price war takes its toll on the bottom line. Certainly we'll see how the EV makers process this but we're still digesting what this whole Evergrande story is going to do and what day two is going to look like in the market. Yeah, especially also, you know, you have two of the Evergrande related stocks coming back, back, on. back online today after that suspension yesterday and I mean, where do we start, right, with this liquidation process? If in fact that is our course of uh, course of travel, so we'll we'll unpack the sort of the different components of what perhaps lies ahead and likely how long that's going to take. In the meantime, though, we're looking at declines based on futures right now, half of one percent. We are overall higher, though, thanks to Japan, thanks to uh, a market like Australia, for example, as you can see there, which is just a few points short. 10 points short of that record high. So if you were looking for an appropriate time to shotgun a can of Foster's, it's probably the next few minutes or so. Um, flip the boards. Thank you so much. A couple of Asia's doing this. Uh, we're also looking at what's happening in commodity markets as, I guess, in many ways, oil traders are still waiting for more information on how the U.S. does respond to attacks over the weekend. We're getting gains across your screens. Uh, we're looking at Shanghai crude pulling back to a little bit. Oil-related stocks in the region flat to slightly higher. The bond market, so two, two things here. You have a two-year bond auction today, number one. Well, three things. Uh, the second one was the refunding announcement and the big amount there. And just in the last few minutes or so, your 10-year yield in China actually dropped to the lowest in about 20, 22 years or so, 2002 uh, levels right now. Very quickly, currency markets doing this. We're focused in on the euro very much so because... That's really underperformed of late. We have the, uh, well, we have the Bank of England decision, but uh, certainly we're back below the 20-day moving average there on the euro. Lots to watch, but all things lead back to this Evergrande story and what this market means for the Chinese market. Of yeah, you know, the big question still remains, right? It, is this order that was implemented by the Hong Kong court yesterday to liquidate Evergrande, is, will that actually follow through in a mainland court here where the bulk of the developer's assets are located? Let's bring our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. He's with us. also want to bring in our Bloomberg Intelligence credit analyst, Daniel Fan. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you. Yeah, are mainland courts going to follow this? And if so, what would the process look like? Yeah, there probably is the big question right now. We simply don't know until they act upon it or, or don't act upon it. Uh, generally, there's open disposal uh, type process like HNA was one example example, and Daniel can probably give a lot more uh, historical perspective on, on, on the unprecedented nature of an unwinding of a company of this size, obviously, and you know, at one time uh, the largest uh, private developer in China. So China Evergrande has, what, $333 billion in liabilities and $248 billion or thereabout in assets, mostly on the mainland. So their stocks and bonds trade here in Hong Kong, uh, but their assets are in mainland China. So the question is, will mainland courts uh, recognize what happened yesterday in a Hong Kong court. And my understanding, and Daniel, you might be able to, to give some clarity on that, China generally views Hong Kong as a foreign jurisdiction. It's courts. So we don't know if they're going to recognize uh, the liquidation order and what that will look like. Mm. And if, if it does not go in lockstep, if they have their own restructuring, if you will, of Evergrande's assets, uh, will that possibly undermine, again, Hong Kong's role uh, as an international financial center and a deal-making center mm. for international investors who are already a little bit gun-shy, a little bit pessimistic about the transparency in mainland China at this time? Daniel, I'll bring you in. Is there a historical president that we can look at to just inform us what this path ahead looks like? I think we, for this kind of size, we haven't seen this. Uh, I think the last one is probably like, other than the latest one like uh, HNA or this, those are kind of sizable but less complicated in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, the one with, it's all the way, probably the last case, all the way go back to the. Um, 2000, when mm. Guangzhou did the liquidation, yeah. it took more than 20 years, mm. actually. 
But I think for Evergrande's case, it's slightly different. If we, I don't have the full information, but based on what I understand, the court order is at Evergrande level, the LISCO in Hong Kong. Uh, it's less about the onshore subsidiary. So mean we can look at it as a way that basically now offshore creditors are taking over the Hong Kong LISCO. So by doing that, you can avoid touching the onshore legal system. And based on what the liquidator comment, they try to keep the onshore operation intact. So meaning that instead of what we always think, okay, uh, we do a liquidation, everything freeze, we can't stop, do a garage sale or whatever. But this time I think it's different. Um, so they just uh, freeze the holding company. So if I can jump in here, yeah. go ahead, go does, ahead. does that mean essentially the company in China will continue to operate as HNA did? The airline kept on running while it was going through a debt restructuring on the mainland behind the scenes. Does that mean essentially also that the central government will prioritize the completion of unfinished units mm -hmm. so there's not some sort of social unrest as well? Because a complete collapse and liquidation on the mainland would be destabilizing, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think exactly uh, to your point. I think the, the, the key is to, yeah, for China, the, the purpose, I mean, the main, main theme is about project completion. If you do an onshore liquidation, everything will be kind of frozen. So now I think you just keep everything ongoing. Because you, if you look at Evergrande, ever since um, they defaulted, they, they still maintain their delivery. So probably, I think, I'm not sure about the figures, right? They deliver 80% of what they sold. So they still have like remaining uh, 20 percent. Yeah, and I think if if it does fall through this order in a mainland, I'm just wondering, Steve, you could talk about what it means for Hong Kong's role. It, it, it sets a pretty important precedent here of, of the city still being a pretty vital fundraising center for a lot of Chinese companies. Well, absolutely, and that it will raise those questions. It adds some more uncertainty towards that. There is a bit of a pessimism right now. We had a guest on earlier today saying essentially they're not invested in China. I'm talking about Belita Ong. Mm. Essentially, they're not invested in China, not since the Jack Ma issues started surfacing back in 2020. I saw that as an interesting example. She's sitting in Santa Barbara, California, and that's kind of the view right now of the investability in mainland China. So if this adds more clouds to an already you know, bleak horizon right now, at least in their minds, yeah. uh, that does uh, undermine it. Now, I want to make one more point about what if we have to read the tea leaves about mainland authorities, He Li Feng, uh, who's basically the economic czar in China, was out in the last 24 hours, essentially reminding the municipalities and cities around China uh, to follow the directives of the central government when it comes to uh, the finances of, of developers and make sure that the, the road to recovery is on track according to the mainland central government's uh, policies. And also, interestingly, and I don't know, Daniel, if you have any in, in, insight onto the amount of money that is sitting in escrow for those pre-sales. He mentioned that as well. It's like ordering the cities to mm -hmm. keep an eye on the piles of money of pre-sales that are in escrow right now so they're not diverted. Mm -hmm. Okay, Is that another way of saying raiding the cookie jar uh, mm -hmm. when things are, you know, trying mm -hmm. to be shaken out? I don't know. Yeah, I think for escrow account, that has been uh, an issue for, for a while. Ever since I think they published uh, this uh, three red line, um, so cash, uh, most of the cash, I, I mean now maybe all of the cash from uh, sales proceeds are kept in escrow account to make sure delivery. That's one of the reasons why uh, developers have less liquidity they're able to use. Yeah, okay, well, the market, Daniel, seems to be uh, Finding a floor, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, high yield bonds, junk bonds are up four straight days. They've outperformed this year so far. Uh, we had a guest yesterday, uh, Jenny Zhang, who said they're very active now trying to pick the survivors. Mm. That's really where you find alpha. Is this development from Evergrande? Is, is this a good thing? Is it almost the start of the closure to a, a painful chapter, really, for Chinese developers? Um, I, I would say the Ever, Evergrande case basically set a precedent. So if you look at the valuation of the bond, the Evergrande is quoting at one cent, two cents. Mm. Uh, how people come up with this number is very simple. I think if you look at uh, Evergrande, they have two listed, they own two listed companies. Right. Uh, one is the uh, EV, uh, another one is a property management company. Mm. If you look at their market cap, 
I think the total amount based on the closing price is uh, around like four, 4.5 uh, billion Hong Kong dollar, mm. compared with 22 billion US dollar of offshore debt, is around two cents, something like that. That's a very rough way of uh, pricing the bond. Yeah. And about your question of uh, picking the survivors, I think um, it's very clear that after like country garden collapse, uh, I think the Chinese government finally realized how serious the situation is um, going to be. So they have all these policy measures, but so far not that effective. But if you look at the bond price movement, uh, largely reflected at that restructuring case or for mm. a lot of the, not that many uh, developers, they are still around. So if you look at some of the financials, mm. some of them are not that bad. Uh, I think people usually cut it in two ways. One is like SOE own, yeah. another one is uh, not SOE own. But there are always like, confusion who is real SOE own, who is not. So, yeah, people try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. I think another way, uh, as a fundamental like, bottom-up bottom -up analyst, uh, I would also look at the, the numbers. So, for example, like Wang Key, people struggle, including myself, before, whether it's uh, SOE own or non SOE own. But if you look at their fundamentals, the financials are good. And then later, the uh, Xinjiang government came out and made comments. And then the major shareholders make comment. And then you revisit the numbers. Then, yeah, you realize uh, the government tend to save those who are really able to help themselves. Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of uh, my understanding. Okay, it seems that we do have at least more clarity at this point. Daniel, thank you so much. Stephen Engel, of course, there as well. Uh, more coming up, of course, on the Evergrande story just ahead here in the broader property sector. Charles Chang out of S&P Global Ratings joins us later on in the shows. But ahead of that, BNP also comes in to talk us through all the macro stuff in China. Rates, FX and everything in between. Cutting down to the open of trade, 18 minutes away. Shanghai, Shenzhen and here in Hong Kong. This is Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Good morning. Take a look at China futures here this morning, seeing a slight pressure when it comes to A50. We're down about a third of 1%. CGBs, as Dave had mentioned earlier, we're basically at two decade lows right now, at the, just below that 250 handle. So 2002 lows uh, for the 10 year yield. And we're continuing to watch uh, what goes on with dollar China. 718.52 here. That fix should be coming uh, any second now, Dave. But certainly a lot of questions on you know, all these policy measures that we've seen in the past few days. What is it going to do for the currency? Yeah, and you know, conventional thinking would suggest that you know more cuts and more easing uh, does weaken the currency, but it's also removing some of the risk premium yeah. uh, in this market. The, the fix is out for today. Here we go. Yep, it is a stronger fix here. Seven ten fifty five. Uh, so we're talking about six hundred. Do the math. Six hundred eighty <laughs> some pips. <laughs> uh, roughly. Chabudu. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's another sign of strong support uh, from the central bank here today. Yeah, at 718.55, we've been bumping our heads on this 200-day moving average, I think twice or thrice in the last three days or so. Let's figure out near, medium, and long-term <laughs> path of the Chinese currency. Zhu Wang is with us here on set, head of Greater China FX and Rate Strategy at BNP Paribas. Nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning. So what, wh what's your assumption on the short-term trading range? On dollar China from here, we have the view that dollar RMB is going to trade in a stable range about 710 to 730 in the first half of this year, mm. and end this year modest lower towards the seven. Mm. Okay, uh, can you tell us a little bit more of the rationale behind that? I mean, do you think that all we've seen so far when it comes to policy measures, you know, reports that we've been talking about of, of a stabilization fund, a stabilization fund for the equity markets, are 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 those is the boost in risk sentiment? I want to say something that overshadows some of the other things that have been going on, like this yield disadvantage that it has with the dollar. Absolutely. Uh, similar to a lot of the yen uh, currencies, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction towards monetary policy easing sometimes can be ambiguous. You know, the, the risk sentiment influence uh, for most of the time were dominant uh, over the short term. Um, so in our view, which we laid out in our 10 top questions for RMB for 2024, we do think the equity market will be uh, uh, the highest answer 
uncertainty points for the cross-border flows. Because when we calculate you know, other factors, for example, Fed is going to cut, but still, even after 150 basis point Fed cuts, the US you know, overnight rate is still going to be 4%. That's our base case. So the dollar is still going to have an advantage over the RMB, which means the dollar wouldn't be that you know, weak. So it would be a range bond market, but the, the, the biggest uncertainty would be on the equity side. Mm. If China can launch the right stimulus at the right time, you know, given the positioning is very, very low in China already, China equities already, uh, valuation is very, very depressed. Mm. Um, at some points, you know, a potential return of foreign inflows can really help the RMB. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you that as well. It's, it hasn't happened yet, but our reporting this week that China's preparing a stock market stabilization fund and bringing some of the money that's offshore back onshore. I know you cover FX and rates, but how big of a deal do you think that is that they are talking about bringing offshore assets back onshore? Yeah, I think... First of all, we need to wait for official announcement, right? Yeah. That's just a, a Bloomberg report. But if it's true, I think it's very meaningful from policy <clears throat> perspective because for uh, people who are very experienced for China market, they are aware that in the late 1990s, early 2000s, China had a similar amount of deflationary pressure as, as we're having now, right? Back then, banks, people were saying banks were literally already effectively bankrupt. Mm. So they used the official reserves to recapitalize the banks and kickstart a new cycle. So to that extent, I think this news is important. It does suggest they're thinking about taking the old textbooks to eventually, you know, kickstart the new cycle. Um, but in terms of knee-jerk reaction, first of all, we need to make sure this is officially correct, you know, mm. real news. Number two is that in terms of implication on FX, we think it's more indirect. Okay. Because the last time when they recapitalized the banks, actually there was no direct spot FX transaction. It's mm. just to transfer reserves to the bank's uh, books. And there were some other cases they did it through FX swaps, which would mean you won't have uh, direct FX you know, spot transaction in the mm. market. It's more of a FX swap with the PBUC right. to facilitate the transaction. But sentiment-wise, I do think if it's, if it's true, it will help the equities, and then it will indirectly help the FX mm. for sure. Yeah, what does it mean for the CGBs? I mean, we, we continue to see this rally kick on, and we're at, at 2002 lows for the 10-year yield. Can, can, have we reached the bottom, do you think? Or do you think it can actually go down further? I think we can have a bit more room to go because our base case is that they're going to deliver this market expect, uh, expected uh, uh, maybe 15 basis point LMF Im immediately, either February or at least before Q1. Mm -hmm. And we think they're going to cut one more uh, 10 basis point into Q2. And by our ca calculation, China's real rates are still very negative. You know, um, so mm. there's a room for cutting. And the interesting thing is that PBUC's governor, during this announcement about the triple cuts, he did mention the Fed pivot will increase room for PBUC to conduct monetary easing. Mm. So that's also sent a signal to the market. You know, uh, a more easing will come. Mm. So put on these two together, I think you know, ten-year CGB still have room to go a right. bit further, particularly when Fed start the easing cycle. And how much? further do you suspect the downside is on 10-year yields? Or, or if it's not the 10-year, where across the CGB curve do you think we might actually see more, more, well, more, more downside? I, I know think, that's a tricky question. Yeah, yeah, it's a tricky question because China is currently also operating the monetary policy in a very nuanced way. The very short end, because they want to prevent the RMB from depreciating, Right. Uh, they also do not want the you know private sector, the security houses, to use the excess liquidity to overly engage in the bond carry position. Mm. So essentially, the interbank fixing are constantly trading 40, 50 basis points above the PBUC's uh, uh, seven-day reverse repo, which mm. is currently 1.8, right? Let's assume yeah. our forecast is right. There's another 25 basis point cut in the benchmark rates to come. Eventually, you know, that... Uh, That's close, though. That's going to get very 
very it will, close. Yeah, it will go to 1.5, the, the benchmark raise. Mm. But the interbank raise will move as well, but still there's uh, some spreads there just to protect the currency and to prevent excessive carry positions. Mm. Um, so in the end, I think uh, we're probably going to head towards closer to 2%, 2% handle. All right, mm -hmm. Juwang, thank you so much, Juwang, there, head of Greater China FX and Race Strategy at BNB Paribas. We're taking a look at when it comes to, of course, those Evergrande assets that are resuming trade here this morning. Uh, that is services as well as NEV. Keep in mind the group, though, we're not getting any news yet of that resumption. But there you go. You're seeing NEV uh, continuing on this decline and slump here of close to 13 percent. So uh, we are starting things off still seeing quite a bit of fallout from this liquidation order here today. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right. Good morning and welcome back. So just just well, literally just under five minutes uh, to the market open. And uh, yeah, OK, so we're looking at fairly uh, a fairly soft approach to the open uh, north of one percent losses right now in the early minutes here on the Hang Seng Index, taking us back below the 16,000 handle. We're back below the flat two and a half percent handle on the 10 year yield. So and of course, we're watching oil prices given uh, well, what's happened and what could potentially happen uh, in the Middle East, of course. Yep. And then trading volume is looking like this here right now. So you are still seeing them quite elevated uh, when it comes to all that's happened here in the last yeah. few days. And, and really the Evergrande story, which continues to be potentially a headwind for stocks today, uh, just given what we're seeing so far with the resumption of trade of Evergrande NEV and services. Uh, in terms of stocks to watch, certainly those are the ones that we have to check and really focus on here today. Um, but we're also watching very closely this chart, Dave. Yeah. I've got a couple of things, too. So we're looking at volumes, too. Um, there's a there's a John Lee briefing. Yes, that's the Hong Kong chief executive at 10 a.m. Of course, and we're watching out for. But given, of course, the local the local news around the, uh, the national security law and the consultations, I believe, of course, that's that's taking place there. So, all the reporting we'll hear from the Hong Kong chief executive, and of course, a couple of things we've already talked about here. Okay. Yeah, so he might go. make that brief announcement, and yeah. this was coming a bit earlier than expected. Mm. They were thinking this consultation may actually happen in February. Um, but we might hear a little bit of it in just a few minutes time. We talked about the CGB rally, what we were seeing in high yield bonds as well, you know, beyond just the Evergrande story. In terms of markets and stocks, uh, we're watching those earnings, those prelim earnings coming out for BYD. Yeah, missing estimates. So the stock is down some nine tenths of one percent. We're watching, of course, some of the supply chain like BYD Electronic also coming out with earnings as well. That's down two percent. And Evergrande NEV down again for a third day by twelve and a half percent or more. The open is next. This is Bloomberg. Good morning from the Asia Pacific. 40 seconds to the opening bell. We're looking at declines uh, ahead of the open, ahead of some key economic data. That's tomorrow, PMI numbers. Uh, you have the Fed, of course, on deck ahead of that. In about 30 minutes from now, Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee is set to speak. Watch out for headlines there. Plus, a lot of the other sectors, of course, we're tracking today. You're starting to hear that little sucking sound coming through when it comes yeah. to these equity markets. Yeah. And that all yeah. the optimism that we saw uh, last week seems to be fading a little bit here right now. Obviously, mm. the Evergrande story is one we're watching out for. Mm. Uh, with those stocks, at least the two of the three, resuming trade here today and already seeing quite a bit of a drop uh, for a third straight day. CGBs, though, that rally continues on for another day. And mm. certainly we've reached some two decade lows for that 10 year yield. So what does that mean for the equity market? Well, we are still facing some pressure here as we talk about how Hong Kong is doing. We're, we're lower by about 1% right now in the pre market. It looks like onshore in Shanghai, we're seeing still declines about six tenths of 1%. HS Tech is where what's really dragging things. We're watching things like PD, like, you know, PDD related stocks, right? We saw that slump. Uh, there was a, a Wall Street, uh, well, Washington Post report talking about maybe Trump has been starting to get ready his team about maybe possibly Im implementing 60% tariffs on yeah. some imported goods. That certainly sent a lot of these uh, stocks heading lower here today. Uh, we're watching very closely what happens with uh, Shanghai Crew, which is coming off just a little bit after that spike that we saw yesterday. Uh, but CGBs, there you go. You're still seeing a green uh, across those three. Um, and we're taking a look at when it comes to uh, 
you know, sector by sector. Uh, we're watching very closely what happens with the tech space. And there you go, all sectors in the red. Developers are certainly very much in focus because uh, there were still some that actually rallied despite the Evergrande news uh, yesterday. But it looks like all sectors are now, uh, we're seeing a broad-based sort of decline. Um, and we take a look at when it comes to specific movers. We talk about the Evergrande assets here. Wuxi Biologics is still another story that we're continuing to see oh, another day oh, of these declines. These stocks can't find a floor. So Evergrande NEV is down 11%. Uh, you have Evergrande Services now see a bit more traction. We're lower by 2.5% as we speak. And Wuxi Biologics still trying to do a bit of damage control uh, over all these kind of comments about this draft bill in the U.S. Uh, you know, Wuxi Aptech now, they're saying that you know, there is no affiliation right now to sort of any sort of military institutions and the like here or any investments by Chinese military-related funds. But still... Still a bit of free fall here. And BYD, there you go. We're down 3%. That's probably what's dragging, really, a lot of this market. Um, and you're watching very close some of these BYD suppliers, just given the fact that, yes, record sales, but you know the bottom line is getting hit by these price wars. Uh, and so certainly that certainly is hitting most of some of these stocks here. x is still doing well. Many so, though. What's the story the there? So the ADRs fell some 10% overnight. Yeah. We're seeing similar declines here right now. Perhaps it's the PDD story. I mean, if, if you're focused and worried about how these commerce stocks are do doing, maybe mini so is part of them. But it, it is continuing that weakness in the consumption space. I think people are still quite worried about. Yeah, I think the PDD was down about 8.5% yeah. uh, overnight. And so you have that, you have the tech, and you have BYD falling this way. It's unsurprising, but it's quite telling that this Chinese market is moving completely the opposite way of the global rally. S&P 500 and, of course, the rest of the region are, are seeing some gains today, so not really feeling the tailwinds of falling yields overall. So what's that rally it? Is this it? William Yuen is here with us on set, investment director at Invesco, to help us answer the question. Good morning. Good morning. So the market's up up until this morning. Was that it? Is this that 8 10% rally we've seen periodically throughout this bear market, or is there more ahead? Yeah, I think for the market-wise, I think volatility is going to be with us for a while. Okay. I think there is um, a lot of known risk within the Chinese equity markets. Mm -hmm. But I also find that a lot of the time people neglect some of the positive developments we're seeing as well. So I think on the on, on balance, I do think that the recent rewards is looking a lot more attractive than, say, six months, 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. Valuation for the Chinese equity market is at a probably close to all-time low, below nine times. That is a discount to about 25% to the Asia, ex Japan uh, equity space. It is probably close to 55% discount to U.S. So I think as investor, especially with a medium to long term horizons, it does pay to be well positioned, early positioned, but then everything we look for has a price. So I think at this moment, the price looks a lot more attractive. Hmm. You mentioned that most of the bad news might, might be priced in and people are overlooking the positives. What, what, what's positive to you? I think the positive is that um, on the policy front, it, it, uh, it is gradually being phased in. Uh, we have seen over the last two months there has been a noticeable pickup in terms of fiscal support, monetary support, and that I think with such a large economy as, as China, it takes time to filter down to all parts of the economy. So I do expect that after the, um, the lunar period, probably the numbers will look a lot more better, mm -hmm. things will start to improve, and that I think will have implications to companies' earnings as well. Is there, we've been t talking about this uh, it, you know, over the past several weeks, you know, the, you know, the positives that most people seem to be ignoring. Mm. It's almost as if there are two parts to this crowd, right? There's, there's the market that follows us very closely, like yourself, like us that cover this every day, mm. that mm. where the positives are quite sure. obvious, right? Like, because we were familiar mm. with the market. But the buyer you need to come back in are sure. those that are not coming anywhere near despite the positive news. And so my question to you is when you talk to that group of people, mm. the institutional investors that have stayed away from yep. the Chinese equity market, are they softening up their view given all the developments recently? Yeah, I think from a recent conversation with a lot of overseas clients, um, definitely the interest in China remains very large. There's a lot of questions about good and bad about data coming out from China, mm. events coming out on a, on a, on a China front or on a geopolitical front. Mm. So we, we are having, um, spending a lot of time to answer those questions. So I think to me, that is a positive signal okay. that people are looking because no matter how you slice it, prices have come off a lot. Yeah. And if I look at the growth driver of China, I think a lot of the um, drivers remains intact. Mm. I think the simplest uh, that I have been looking a lot more on is the consumption side. 
if you look at the consumption of GDP, I mean, China is still only about 53 percent. Uh, Compare that to the major economies, they are hovering about 70 to 80 percent of cons- consumption. Mm. So on that side, I think definitely there is still a lot more room to grow. Mm. If I look at the consumption patterns, um, clearly there have been a change in patterns. Uh, the value segment or the so-called lower price segment has seen a, a tremendous boost given the economic challenges over the last two years. So that has done very well for companies that are positioned on that lower value segment. Mm. But at the same time, the pricier luxury hasn't disappeared. It just has changed. Mm. They're looking at a lot more on the premium but with quality. So I think that, that those two segments being a, a kind of opposite extreme has done very well for those companies. But whenever those companies that are stuck in the middle positioning for the mass market or those, mm-hmm. we have seen really a lot of those earnings suffer tremendously over the last six months. Mm. Uh, how, how are earnings faring up to you? I mean, I, I'm just wondering, is, is earnings downgrades, is that still yeah. a risk for this market? I think if I look back at the earnings downgrade trend for the Chinese equity space industry, um, pretty much most of the downgrade happened towards the end of the first half of 2023. Towards um, the end of the year, we did see continuation of downgrades. Mm. So my starting point is that the expectation is actually very low. So if I look at the uh, upcoming reporting season, I do expect that naturally the real estate sectors or industries that are related to the real estate sector, whether it's cement, building materials, those are probably going to be not reporting good results, I mean, mm. to be fair. Mm. And, but at the same token, there are bright spots. Um, internet companies, games company, e-commerce that are tailoring for the lower segment, I mean, they have report a pretty decent result throughout the year. And I do expect that in fourth quarter, they will be able to deliver a pretty robust result as well. Okay. So what, what do we buy and what do we, what do we stay away from? I think at this moment, um, going back to the core theme that I, I have established, I think mean, China still have growth. Consumption okay. is going to be with us for a while. Uh, there is no way exhausted in terms of growth. So um, consumption stocks definitely are something that we continue to look at. Mm. Uh, on top, I think, of the exposure that they will have for underlying Chinese consumers, a lot of these Chinese consumers, uh, consumer companies, are also exposed to neighboring ASEAN countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, mm. that has also seen very robust economic growth that drives per capita income up. So those companies being early in those ASEAN smaller Asian markets would also be able to capture some of that supply. Mm. So I mean, those will be a lot of the kind of the interesting spots. And uh, I mean, actively, would you actively be avoiding names that might be caught in sort of the geopolitical equation? So we, we were talking about, mm. um, what are the two names that they're distancing? Wuxi. Yeah. Mm. Uh, PDD, for example, overnight fell overnight. Are those not no specific names, but is this a theme that investors need to be wary of? Avoid those names that might get caught in these cross currents. Yeah, I think if uh, looking back at the last 24 months, I think one lesson that um, myself and our team has learned is that um, we are not in a position to second guess geopolitics. We will never get it right. Mm. So I think when we look at industry and companies that could be ex- potentially exposed to those risks, we try to avoid. Mm. So we try to keep it as simple, mm. having high visibility in terms of industry dynamics and company prospects. So I think that's where we are. So I think, um, like, as you, the examples you gave about pharmaceutical, definitely that have exposure in the US. Uh, something that we have been very cautious. Mm. Same applies for um, IT hardware that could be subject to potentially tighten Chips Act, yeah. for yeah. example. William, great stuff. Thank you. William Yuan there, Investment Director mm. at Invesco, joining us here in our studios. Um, and we talk about another ongoing theme that we've seen as well. Chinese appetite for overseas equities is running high. It's among investors burned by years of underperformance in the domestic markets. And this has really fueled some huge price distortions in funds tracking these assets. For more, let's bring in our Bloomberg Intelligence ETF analyst, Rebecca Sin. Yeah, so what are, what's happening to these Chinese funds business at the moment? So foreign funds in China are seeing record inflows at the moment. Um, the Chinese route has led investors to look to alternative asset class uh, that are performing. And so, for instance, CSI 300 is down 15% from last year. NASDAQ, S&P 500, Nikkei are at an all-time high. So investors are fleeing to those asset class. So no surprise there. But what's happened is, unfortunately, in China, there's a quota on how much each fund house can hold in foreign assets. And a lot of these ETFs and mutual funds have now reached this quota, or they're near this quota. And as a result, 
result of this, the ETF is now trading at a premium. We saw last week EFUN MSCI USA 50 reach a premium of almost uh, 43%. And so as a result of this, they have had to halt trading. And so it's not uncommon for ETFs to be halted. It's usually halted in the first hour. Um, CSRC gave some warning, uh, a high premium warning, whenever the ETF trades at a premium of more than 10%. And we've seen some funds get as much as 12 warnings from the CSRC. And so ultimately, this is a cue to investors to be cautious. Watch out, this investor is trading at a premium. Yeah, you're talking about a double whammy here. I mean, mm. can, is this meaning that this trend can continue or cannot? So I think the double whammy is that investors are selling out of China. So they've lost money in China. Now they're going into foreign assets at an all-time high. So they're investing into S&P, they're investing into Nikkei 225, they're investing into Nasdaq. Should those market correct or have a little drop, then they're going to be burned twice. And so that's one of the concerns. And that's where CSRC is saying, look, you know, these ETFs are trading at a premium. Is it really worth investing into? And it's not uncommon for ETFs to trade at a premium or discount. It happens. Uh, but 43% is a lot. So think of it as if you're an investor, you've been burned by China, you're now investing into uh, USA at a 43% premium. It's really hard to make that money back. Hmm. What, what could happen next? So I think what could happen next is, one, we could see more ETFs being halted. Uh, we could see more warnings coming. Uh, the premiums will trade at a premium and discount depending on what market does. But yeah. the problem is that there's only a set number of ETFs that have a QD. And so more and more investors are looking for this, and until that universe broadens, they're still stuck with a quota. They can't go beyond that. And to increase quota on a fund house is very difficult. It takes time. It takes three to six months um, before they're even allowed to increase the quota. So we could see more ETFs being halted, more tr ETFs trading at a premium. That premium could widen. It's at 43%. It could reach 50 60%. Um, but I think what may alleviate this is that we could see uh, other ETF issuers launch overseas products. So for instance, China Universe has filed for an MSCI USA ETF. It's going to launch in the coming weeks. And as a new ETF, they may not run into the quota that some of these older ETFs have. And so I think we could see more launches coming from onshore investors into foreign ETFs. And ultimately, that will diversify the pool. There'll be more products for people to invest into. Um, and hopefully, that should help. Rebecca, thank you. Rebecca Sin, our Bloomberg Intelligence ETF analyst there. Uh, 12 minutes into the session, and yeah, this Chinese market is going the opposite way of regional peers led by tech down 1.7%. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right. Reason why we're seeing a bit of a downdrift here when it comes to equities today. BYD, that stock is down some 3.6 percent. These prelim earnings that came out certainly did send ADRs as well as now the stock lower here. So, yes, record sales didn't transfer to bumper profits, though. Uh, this is also impacting most, but not all, of the EV space. Xpeng is doing something else, though, but you've seen the likes of Geely down some 2% as well in tandem. Let's bring in, of course, our EV supply chain reporter, Danny Lee, joining us now. It's, you, you can see in the numbers now, these price wars are really taking a toll. Yeah, and you see the, the, the level of the, the profitability, especially when you calculate the fourth quarter, is much lower uh, than what you saw in the third quarter. And this is despite record sales. So you can see the, the big hit that the, the car company, someone like BYD, is having to take, and at least in the year end, to try and hit its annual sales. So, yeah, uh, still uh, you know, very robust, but uh, not as good as what it was expected. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, if you know, these sorts of greater forces are showing up, in BYD, they're probably going to show up in the others, aren't they? Absolutely. And you know, for the others, they are, have much significantly smaller uh, levels of sale. And, mm -hmm. and, and for those players, they've also been struggling financially, you know, trying to do deals to ensure that they can shore up their balance sheets, raise funds. So BYD is still in a very strong position. And you, know, you still contrast that with last week, how Tesla performed. Yeah. You know, it still yes. had very good set of numbers, although not as good as what the market expected. And then no guide um, in to 2024. But, you know, for BYD, they, they've come off uh, many, many multi-years of, of growing and investing, and now that's all paying off. Geopolitical tensions, are we seeing that taking a toll at all right now, or could be something that we need to think about midterm? 
it's still something to think about midterm. I mean, the geopolitics is, is very much a, an overhang of what they're trying to do at the moment, and particularly as they push into the more international markets, such as Europe, still hasn't stopped them from investing billions into what's going to be in Hungary, where it's going to have its first uh, factory to, to produce, produce EVs. So there is still potential for them to, to do really well in 2024, but it's just that unknown of how the EU, with its investigation over subsidies into uh, for the Chinese EV makers have had, uh, will fare out. Right. And, you know, if all, all things considered, should I also be concerned about the suppliers of BYD? And if this is a margin hit and not so much a volume hit, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to suggest I should be worried about suppliers, or am I sort of misleading, misled, misled in my head there. I think the beauty for BYD is because of the way it's grown and the way it's um, you know, developed over years, the fact that most of what it does is in-house and particularly the key components. Okay. So they shouldn't have too much to worry about. Uh, they won't have to put themselves under pressure. They're very efficient. You know, they will be able to eke out more gains and, and you know, tug on the levers to ensure that it can you know, still produce what it wants to produce at you know, decent uh, margins and, and profitability. But it's the others who uh, clearly are much smaller scale will have that, that challenge over the, uh, the year to come as it seems like this price war is, is almost never ending. Yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, Danny, thank you so much, Danny Lee our supply chain and aviation reporter. Okay, let's uh, get you an update of some other corporate stories that we're tracking uh, right now. So GM and staying in automotive here uh, is boosting its quarterly dividend by one third to 12 cents a share. The payouts will come on March 14 for investors holding shares on the first of that month. So that's the record date. Uh, the announcement came ahead of the carmaker's quarterly earnings report that's due later on Tuesday. Bloomberg Intelligence expects profits exceeding Wall Street estimates on the back of increased output after the UAW strikes. Now, Renault has scrapped plans to list its electric vehicle business, uh, Ampere, uh, due to a lack of appetite for share sales amid a slowdown in demand. It was seeking a valuation of about $8.7 billion for the business, which is almost as much as Renault's own market value. The performance of EV-related listings fell about 35% over the past 12 months. Now, Elon Musk has, uh, well, says uh, the first human received a Neuralink brain transplant in a post, this post on X. Musk says the patient is recovering well with initial results calling what he calls promising neuron spike detection. The startup aims to create a computer brain interface that will initially enable people with paralysis to control external devices with their thoughts. The company's raised more than $500 million in venture capital since 2016. And Golf's PGA Tour is said to be close to finalizing a, an investment from a U.S. consortium led by Fenway Sports, known as Strategic Sports Group. It includes New York Mets owner Steve Cohen's family office and former Milwaukee Bucks co-owner Mark Lazary. Sources say the initial investment could be about $3 billion with an additional tranche from the Saudi Public Investment Fund. Okay, that's a wrap of your corporate stories. Plenty more heads. This is Bloomberg. Are sold. All right, we're taking a look at some of the big political stories that we're following for you today. Qatar says negotiations to free hostages taken by Hamas during its October attack on Israel are making progress. The Prime Minister, Sheikh Mohammed Al Thani, says talks are moving to a place which could lead to a potential permanent ceasefire. Qatar is the key mediator in talks between Israel and Hamas. Right now, I will describe it, uh, the progress uh, that we are achieved, that we are making uh, in the last couple of weeks is, is we are in much better place than where we were uh, a few weeks ago. We've learned that Russia is considering an indefinite suspension of wartime capital controls. The measures are aimed at easing pressure on the ruble after international sanctions over Russia's war in Ukraine. The restrictions require exporters, including oil producers, to repatriate 80 percent of their overseas earnings. Ninety percent of that must be sold for rubles.
The Biden administration is warning that it may restore sanctions on Venezuela's energy sector. That's if the government upholds its ban on opposition candidate Maria Corina Machado from running for president. Existing sanctions were suspended for six months through April. Sources say Washington will consider other measures if Machado is kept off the ballot. We're continuing to follow shares of Evergrande and also shares of Wuxi, Bio and Aptech. So we've now reversed higher. There we go. So both services and NEV have resumed trade today. Uh, we were down as much as 12% at one point and have since reversed that as you can see on your screens and also with Wuxi Biotech, but certainly nowhere near levels of last Thursday. Stock's probably still down 20, 25%. Uh, a glance under the hood on the HS Tech Index, we're down 2% now and almost Every single stock here is down with the exception of Xpeng and Lenovo. Uh, of course, the big news overnight was PDD and falling about 8.5%. So your big tech and your sort of mega caps in China are all leading declines in the order from 1% to maybe even 3%. Uh, and Chinese markets are down in the first 25 minutes when you look at the benchmarks here on your screen. Yeah, and, and doing something very different than the rest of this equity market after yeah. we're, you know, we're close to all, you know, all-time highs for Australia, the AXX, uh, and Japan still doing quite well here today, and of course the S&P. Uh, just given some of those quarterly refunding that we got from the Treasury, that really sent stocks and bonds uh, fired up here overnight. China not doing so well right now, and it seems like maybe these sort of, you know, all this optimism around policy, synchronized uh, stimulus measures seems to be fading here this morning. The rest of Asia looking flat here, but mostly doing better. And we're seeing a pretty mixed picture across sector by sector. But we'll go on you through markets coming up at the top of the hour. This is Bloomberg.